My name is Kirk Whalum, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about meaning, about the things you think you know about you and about life, things at the core of who you are and how you understand the world. Things that are axiomatic to your very identity can change so drastically over time and sometimes in an instant. Since I'm not a philosopher, I will just share a little bit from my own life experience. I'll share a couple of scenarios, but we'll start with a little low-hanging fruit from a philosopher by the name of Descartes, who said, of course, famously, I think, before I am. Maybe for the purposes of just our little time together, I'll say my life has meaning or significance, therefore I am. By that definition, well, there's lots of rich people and lots of poor people who are not because their lives lack that meaning, that significance. But we can do something about that. We can share our humanity. We can share our resources, we can share our empathy, and we afford each other a certain amount of dignity and meaning and significance. I love Frank Schaefer. Frank Schaefer always says, okay, whatever I say today, take it with a grain of salt. Because 20 years ago, I was probably saying something different. And in 20 years, I'll probably be saying something yet again different. But that just means that meaning is not that it's not meaningful, it's just that as we evolve, so does meaning. I'm in a study group with a lot of great people. The writings of a prolific writer named Richard Rohr, Father Richard Rohr. And one of his books is called Falling Upward. It's basically about the two halves of life. How that, and I can talk about that because I'm 64. First half of life, you're going after it. You know, you're, you're going to build something. It's a lot of work, a lot of energy. Second half of life, not so much. Really, it's about what goes in that thing, that container that you built. Second half of life is about clarity. And I am very much about clarity right now, this, this phase in my life. If you come to my studio, uh, which is not far from here, right here in Memphis, um, you'll see that I have a lot of keepsakes. Like you walk up the stairs to my studio, it's almost like you're walking up the stairs of my life. You're walking through these stages of meaning, of significance for me, all the way from the beginning. You know, I saw funny. I had a black mustache and, you know, a lot of hair. And it, you, you can see what what was meaningful to me at whatever stage. Was posters of jazz festivals and posters of performances at clubs and collaborations with this one and that one, posters of albums, projects that I've done, a lot of which were pretty successful, and some not so much. But it all works together, and it all signifies meaning. So I'll share with you this first scenario about this particular thing in my life that gave me such meaning because I was, at one time, a Columbia recording artist. Skip ahead and say, later on, I was a Warner Brothers artist, so don't feel too sad about the story. I was a Columbia recording artist and until I wasn't. Because I was unceremoniously dropped from Columbia Records, and now I remember exactly why. It was because I had done a record, a project, called In This Life, it was kind of a country soul jazz record. Are you dizzy yet? Um, sounded like a great idea to me at the time. And I think if certain people had done that record, they'd have said, that's the best idea I ever heard. For whatever reason, something about me, that was a non sequitur for the folks at Columbia. Maybe my color, my skin, I don't know, but it didn't work for them. And yeah, they really didn't have any interest in me doing a country soul record. Well, this was the moment that I decided to have what we call a pity party. I had big black balloons. Uh, I didn't, but it was, it was bad. And I was just about to jump into my party and my wife, okay, 
we've been together 50 years. Uh, we've been married 43, so we kind of grew up together. So she kind of knows exactly what to do. So we were like that. And she, she spoke to me in that moment. She said, okay. Two letters. But those two letters were like a giant comma in my life. She said, okay, what can you do today that you couldn't do yesterday when you were a Columbia recording artist? Kind of infuriated me. Because <laughs> again, you know, I had my plan. I was about to, you know, really sulk and get into it. But the truth is that I knew the answer to that question. I had to admit it to myself and get unmad because I knew what she meant and I knew exactly what I would have done because at the time I was touring with artists Jonathan Butler, George Duke, Rochelle Farrell. We were out there doing our thing, 2,000, 3,000, 3, 4,000 seaters, you know, playing funk, soul, rocking out, people having their drinks and having a good time. And just randomly, Jonathan Butler went into a hymn. He started playing, Precious Lord, take my hand. That moment was the extended standing ovation that we had been waiting for the whole tour. We had a really great show with people clapping. Now is the moment where they all stood up and they wouldn't sit down. Why? Because we did this hymn. You better know that the next city we did another hymn, <laughs> and the next city, another hymn, and, and I knew that that's what I would do. I, to answer my wife's question, I would do a series of that, where you get artists who are not gospel artists, or not maybe necessarily Christians like me, but that they were willing to share their spiritual journey with the audience in the middle of a pop concert or whatever, and we called it The Gospel According to Jazz, the series, chapter one through four. Spoke about keepsakes, right? I have a keepsake as a statue. It's called a Grammy. <laughs> for, not for anything I did on Columbia Records. It's for the series that I did because my wife pushed me into an area that I was not comfortable with because I didn't give myself permission to do what I really felt like I wanted to do. So busy trying to be a Columbia recording artist. Well, yeah, they, they, they didn't, they weren't with it, <laughs> you know. They, did, they weren't any more interested in me doing a gospel jazz record than they were me doing a country soul record. But here I sit with a Grammy. Okay, now, fast forward almost 10 years. I'm in South Africa, go to the first city and just with my band, and I Go to do the interview, and the gentleman says, I'm so glad you're here. I can't wait. I know you're going to do something from in this life. I'm like, now that is the rudest, most insensitive thing I have, I can imagine anybody saying to me. Way over here or anywhere, he is talking about the country soul record. <laughs> I'm like, why? How cruel, insensitive. So you were going to bring this record up? I said, no, we don't do anything from that record. He was like, you don't? Oh, my goodness, that record is huge here in South Africa. It's huge all over the continent of Africa. It's huge in Brazil. It's huge here. It's huge there. Uh, even here, I get, you know, people like Roland Martin, the, the journalist, he's like, my favorite record. He, first time I met him, you know, I'm like watching him on TV. I meet him backstage. He said, Kirk Whalen, my favorite record you ever did. And I'm thinking of all these other records. He said, it's in this life, the country soul record. Okay, so another scenario. I stand before you as the saxophone player who has played the sax solo that's been heard by more people than any other saxophone solo in recorded history. Right, so I don't get that accolade. And I would give that accolade to John Coltrane or Charles Lloyd from right here in Memphis, or, you know, Johnny Hodges. I, you just name some of my favorites, my heroes. I would give that to them, but no, it's me. And you know why that is? I'll tell you why. My boss at the time, this lady named Whitney Houston, insisted 
to the chagrin of the directors of the movie to sing that song, I Will Always Love You, live to the film, Bodyguard. And to have her band perform live with her. On the set of the movie, director's head explodes. <laughs> He's like, he didn't say this out loud, but I know it's hard. He's like, that's not going to happen. Oh, well, that's a great idea, Whitney. Eventually, they said, no, that's not going to happen, Whitney. So to, she responded and said, oh, really? OK, so then you have a problem. You're going to have to find a singer. Because if I sing it, I'm going to sing it live. My band is going to play live. Well, history records that we actually did do it live. And because of that, I can say that about that solo. And by the way, today as I speak is the 11th anniversary of her death. And speaking of her death, we fast forward to the funeral. I was out of my mind. I didn't know how to process this thing. None of us did. The band, we're all just sitting there at the funeral, at the church with our instruments. We're playing, but still just kind of there, but not there. And I remember kind of checking out, and I, and I had this vision, a uh, revelation, a uh, daydream, something where I saw Jesus singing, I will always love you, to his disciples. First of all, let me report to you that Jesus could really sing. <laughs> I mean, think about it. He was Jewish. Many of the prayers are sung. They sing a lot. And the fact that perfect light, perfect, unconditional, self-giving love and acceptance opens its mouth to sing. How would that sound? Let me tell you, it sounded amazing. Well, Jesus sang in that moment out of desperation because the disciples were sitting there listening to him once again talk about, oh, no, you don't understand. There's something coming down the pike that has to happen. Right now, you've gotten used to what is really the upside down kingdom. But what's going to happen because of this sacrifice that I'm going to make it's going to be now the right side up kingdom. There's not going to be any more war. There will be no more strife, no poverty, no sickness, no death. But it begins with sacrifice. So it's got to happen. But they yet did not get it. They're like, I, I, uh, no, <laughs> that ain't going to happen. We are not going to let it happen. And so Jesus just goes, he began to sing. He said, if I should stay, I'd only be in the way. So, I'll go. And yet, I know, as he looked around at them, I know that I'll think of you every step of the way. And I will always love you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Think about this thing that had to happen. And he's saying to them, if I stayed, yeah, you might be happy, but only for a while because then I would die just like you. But no, now because of this thing I'm going to do, guess what? You'll be very glad because... I'll be with you forever, and I will always love you. Perhaps Whitney understood Dolly's lyric differently from the beginning. Maybe that's why she insisted on, A, surrounding herself with people who prayed as well as played for her, and B, depending on the Spirit to speak through her in the moment. That perspective would change exponentially. 
the significance of her tragically short life. Hopefully this new take on I Will Always Love You and my anecdote about how Columbia Records dropped me into my destiny <laughs> has made you think a little bit about meaning and how it can change. At the very least, I hope you'll never hear this song the same again. Thank you, guys.